The oceans cover the vast majority of Earth's surface. There are many aspects of oceanography, the study of ocean, that we're going to cover. However, we're just going to do it very quickly. We're going to cover tides, currents in weather, waves, salinity, life in the ocean, and features of the ocean floor. First, tides. If you've been to the beach, you know that the height of the water changes throughout the day. This is called the tides. Tides are the daily rise and fall of ocean water caused by the moon and sun's gravitational pull. However, the moon is what actually causes most of the change in tides. Typically, you get about two high tides and two low tides a day. It happens a little over six hours between tides. We call it a spring tide when we have the greatest tidal range and a neap tide because of the lowest tidal range. Now let's figure out what this means. What happens? Here we have the Earth and the Moon. Now this is exaggerated in scale. And we have the Earth spinning beneath the Moon. Notice the side of the Earth facing the Moon is bulging outward. There is a gravitational attractive force between the Moon and the Earth. Neither of the two physical objects move much. However, the water is free to move a bit more. So this creates a water bulge underneath the moon. Due to centrifugal force, the far side of the Earth from the moon also bulges outward. Since there's only so much water on Earth's surface, if you have a bulge underneath the moon and a bulge on the far side of the moon, this gives you less water on the opposite two sides. Right? So the sides where we're bulging, just under the moon and on the far side, are called high tide, and the sides where the, the water is low, called low tide. And you see that in that animation here, showing the height of the water level at this red dot as it spins along Earth's surface. High tide, low tide, high tide, low tide and the moon is what causes the change. Since we spin, we get two high tides and two low tides each day. However, the moon isn't the only thing that affects the Earth's tides. The sun does as well. It's just a little weaker. Here's an example of extreme tides. This is Mount St. Michel, the north coast of France, at low tide. You see the the town, uh, fortified town, a little road going out towards it, here's some cars, um, even some buses. And you notice that the area around it is all dry, except for a little bit of a stream there. This is low tide. This is high tide, slightly different angle unfortunately, but you'll notice that all the way up to this green is flooded. Here's the green on this map. So where these people are walking is safe, but where these people park their cars is not. So if you want to visit there, you will find all sorts of signs all over the place pointing out the times for the high tide to make sure that your cars and buses and you yourself don't wash away. This made it a beautiful spot to build a town if you were concerned about opposing enemies because there's only one way that an enemy can come. All you have to do is lock your gate, and if your army is out here, they're going to die. I, the moon affects the tides most strongly, but the sun helps as well. Twice a month, the moon and the earth and the sun line up in a row. That's at the new moon and the full moon. Now the moon pulls the water towards it, and it always has a bulge on the far side whether it's at either location. And then the sun draws the, the Earth's water a little bit more towards it and a little bit more to the far side, again, for the same reason. So when all three of them line up, either at the new or the full, they work together. The two bulges, the moon bulge, which is larger, and the sun bulge, which is a little smaller because the sun is so much further away, 
pull together, so you get a high, high tide and a low, low tide. These are called the spring tides. Now they happen twice a month, so it's not spring in the seasonal sense. It's spring is in the boing, boing, boing sense. You've got super high, high, low, high tides and super low, low tides. So very high, very low, very high, very low. Springy. Neap tides happen at the first and third quarter when the moon is at right angles to the earth as compared to the sun. The moon is pulling this way and the sun is pulling this way. They counteract each other so the high tides don't get very high and the low tides don't get very low. So it's called a neap tide. Neap. Not a high high, not a low low. It barely changes just a little bit. Currents and weather. Currents, as we've discussed before, do strongly affect the weather, as does the oceans. The oceans act as insulators, keeping the uh, coastlines from getting too hot or too cold. Plus, warm currents help keep the, um, the areas near them warm and wet. Cold currents cool off the area and make them drier. This is why oh, the warm current from the Gulf Spring stream is why England gets such a mild climate for its latitude. The ocean also drives, provides most of the moisture for weather. Waves are produced by wind. The faster the wind blows, the larger the waves. The longer the wind blows, the larger the waves. And if it, the waves blow over a larger area, you get bigger waves. This is why a lake gets bigger waves than a swimming pool, and an ocean gets bigger waves than a lake. Okay. Waves also aren't moving. The water actually doesn't move with the, with the uh, wave. The particles in the water are actually doing this, as you see in these animations. It's not moving forward. They're moving in circular patterns. Kind of neat. This is why if you see a buoy, it's in the water. It floats up and down, depending on the wave. But it doesn't move side to side all that much. Now, as waves approach land, the sea level, the, the the land underneath is higher, so that it starts to affect the motion of these um, particles. So this is forced to slow down while these are still going at a higher rate. That's why waves break as they approach the land. And as waves approach the land, they erode the coastline. We're going to be dealing with this a bit more in our lab. Salinity. Probably what we think of most clearly with the ocean is the salt. And the salt in the ocean is very similar to table salt. Its uh, chemical formula is NaCl, sodium chloride. The chloride is primarily from volcanoes and the sodium is from rivers. It's washed out of off of land. Water flows across the land, dissolves any minerals in the rocks, including sodium and chloride, and uh, washes it into the ocean. The sodium and chloride are left behind in the ocean when the water evaporates, so the ocean keeps gets more and more salt added all the time. Now, ocean water is more dense than fresh water because it's got the salt in it. So you tend to float higher in the ocean than you do in fresh water. It's harder to sink, so to speak. The saltier the water is, the deeper it sinks. And also the colder the water is, the more it sinks. If uh, you want to see how this works, there's a YouTube video called The uh, Icy Finger of Death. Kind of fun, you might want to take a look at it. All right. Now, as ice forms, it leaves behind the salt, and so the water gets even saltier. And that's what you'll see in that video. But when ice melts or rain increases, then the water becomes less saline. 
this becomes important when you're talking about climate change because the oceans change as well, which can affect a great deal of the life in the ocean. Speaking of life, we have a couple different layers in the ocean. Creatures that live on the bottom of the ocean we call benthic, B for bottom. Creatures that live in the seawater and float around are called pelagic species. The most common are phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are extremely tiny. Uh, if you think of algae, uh, that's the same idea. Here are some microscopic images of them. They are photosynthetic and they are what the basis of all life is in the ocean because they take energy from the sun and turn it into nutrients. They also produce oxygen. They do do photosynthesis and they actually do more photosynthesis than the plants on land do. More oceanography. Remember with El Nino we talked about how the wind blows off the shore of Peru and uh, blows away the warmer water on top and cooler water comes up from the bottom. This is called upwelling. Now when things die in the ocean they sink to the bottom and their bodies sink to the bottom, which makes it very nutrient rich. So when this water comes to the surface, it brings with it a lot of nutrient rich material, which makes it prime for biological activity. Areas of upwelling are usually great fisheries. The Chesapeake Bay, in this image, is a great example of an estuary. It's a place where the fresh water of land is mixing with the salt water of the ocean. When you're down here at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, it's going to be much more saline. Whereas if you go further inland, it becomes more freshwater. This is great for giving you all sorts of variety um, of life. So there's a huge amount of life, much of which we care about. If you eat blue crab, or like oysters, or fish, you really want the salinity to be nice and different along here. And you want to try and protect these estuaries. They're also incredibly important for migrational birds. Finally, we're going to discuss the ocean floor. You've seen this before. You have the ocean floor and here's the surface of the water that we're peering beneath. The continent doesn't actually end at the waterline. The continent continues out and this is called the, con the continental shelf. At the edge of the continental shelf is the continental slope, labeled A. And it's on the far side too. F, here's the continental shelf, and then it drops down to the continental slope. The majority of the ocean is the flat area called the abyssal plain. Abyss means deep, and a plain is a flat area. So this is the deep, flat area that makes up the majority of the ocean at sea. B, these are undersea mountains. They're called sea mounts for obvious reasons. They're typically volcanic. In the center of the ocean is this ridge, meaning a high area, the mid-ocean ridge. This is actually where the two plates are moving apart. It's dividing or, di or divergent boundary. The plate is moving apart. Lava comes up from underneath, builds these volcanoes, and then it moves apart, and so the volcanoes are moved to the side, and new ones pull in, and it moves to the side, new one pulls in, and it's constant cycle here. Then we have the abyssal plain on the other side, and here we have a seamount that actually has become a volcanic island. This is what Iceland would be, or Hawaii. And finally, over here we have an extremely deep area. This is called a trench like a great big ditch, but what's happening is that this ocean floor is sinking underneath this continental crust. It is a convergent boundary. It's where the two plates are crashing into each other. And so as this crashes into the other, it sort of loses and it sinks underneath. So let's see what that looks like on, land, on the actual planet. Google Earth, gotta love it. We've got different shapes of blue for different depths. This pale blue is showing you the continental shelf. 
Notice the continental shelf sticks well out into the water. Right? The sudden drop-off is the continental slope. And then we've got the lovely flat abyssal plain interspersed here and there by seamounts. This long scratch or scab down the center is very much like a scab on, on a, your skin. It's where blood comes up to the surface and solidifies. Here it's where lava comes up to the surface and solidifies. So it's a great big scar across the ocean floor. And that's your mid-ocean ridge. Again, you've got the abyssal plain here we've got a volcanic island, that's Iceland, it's actually on the mid-ocean ridge. And then you're back to the continental slope and continental shelf. Down here, this is South America, Chile. This brown is the Andes Mountains. And notice this deep, deep blue color. This is a trench. What's happening? This is that convergent boundary. This part of the Pacific Ocean floor is crashing into it and it sinks underneath. You can sort of see it almost looks like a seam and it's a, it rolls underneath the land and makes this trench. Sort of like if you go to the grocery store and you put your uh, groceries on that conveyor belt, it rolls along and sinks down underneath at the cashier. And that's what's happening to the land here to produce the trench.